Hello, all you spry tubers, twitchers, and pod people out there. Welcome to the Could You Do It Better podcast. We're filmmaker, gamer extraordinaire, and the behind-the-scenes awesomeness known as Sesh, and the award-winning writing and directing sensation known as Maria. Discuss popular television shows and movies and answer the always controversial question of, could you do it better? Today, we will be discussing Season 1, Episode 2 of Lauren Schmidt Hisrick's The Witcher television series, based upon Andrzej Sapkowski's The Witcher novel series. And as for me, I'm Jonathan the Intern, and unlike our two experts, have no industry experience whatsoever. In other words, I'm much like the Bard of Posada. My original content that is unlistenable, all my working knowledge and opinions are fictional fantasies, and wait just a gosh darn second, I do not constantly carry loaves in my pants. And now to Sesh and Maria. Woo! Woo! We're here. Yes. <laughs> kind of. Yes. Now before before I get to uh, uh, starting with our spoiler alert, I should say that Maria might be absent today uh, because this weekend she won an award for best comedy screenplay. So yeah, we love it. Applause. She was nominated. We were trying to keep it under wraps, uh, uh, not get overly, overly excited, and uh, she pulled off the win. So we are, we are very proud of her here, and uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, so uh, with that, we will now get to episode two of this series, and obviously, spoiler warning. In this episode, we will be doing a detailed recap of Season 1, Episode 2 of The Witcher TV series that will contain spoilers throughout. So if you haven't watched this episode and don't want to hear spoilers before you do, please feel free to put us on mute as you watch the episode, then re-watch our show afterwards. Because that's how you double view counts. And now, on to the recap, as mandated by our legal department. Open on a romance in a small farm town. It's the worst type of teen romance. You know, the one where you have two incorrigible personalities that bully a pig farmer's daughter so cruelly she portals to a tower of skull and bone? In the Tower of Gull, she meets Istrid, who tells her she's got the magics in her, and someone will be after her for using them, then sends her back home to her loving father, who sells her to the first witch she meets for four coins, much to her and her mom's dismay. After saying she won't go, she finds herself locked in a room with a mirror which she promptly shatters, further decreasing her value. Furious, she takes the shattered piece, hikes up her sleeve, and... Intro! With a symbol of star and snakes. Over to Princess Ciri, running and hiding in the forest, where she takes a rejuvenating mud bath and makes a new friend that shares dinner rats with her and keeps her from eating poison berries. She gives Ratman her glove, confides in him she's running from a man who scalps Big Bird and can't be caught by him, then runs towards the obvious Nilfgaardians pretending to be Centrum Flag Bearers? Question mark? Cut to a bard in a tavern singing about Roe v. Wade. Bad move on his part as this is an election year, so the crowd is at peak hostility. He stumbles over to Geralt, sitting in the corner, and in just three simple words, Geralt gets himself a lifelong friend and a job to kill grain-eating devils. The bard offers to be Geralt's personal MC, though starting off with calling him the Butcher of Blaviken earns him a swift gut punch. Over to the pig farmer's daughter, where he finds she failed at offing herself and that she enrolled at Hogwarts, with the woman who bought her, Visea, as her teacher. Her first lesson to the class is to make a rock float. Frigella does this immediately, and her hand withers and dies, teaching us two things. One, There's a give and take to magic. And two, this teacher is a dick. Why won't you explain that first? It takes a second. (laughs) Everyone in the class eventually is able to elevate a rock by killing a flower, except for Piglet. Piglet walks off and finds Istra to inform him her name is now Yennefer, much to the dismay of Christopher Robin. (laughs) Back to Ciri, who finds a Sintrin refugee camp where she makes friends with a boy who collects elf ears and who has a family that hates the queen. Ah, young romance. Cut to the buddy comedy of Geralt and his bard, and Geralt finds his devil's actually a wisecracking Sylvan. After a few yo mama jokes, Geralt gets knocked out. 
jump to magic school and to say a second lesson is for students to see partner spheres with their eyes. Yennefer again can't do it, so she sneaks off to do her Vulcan mind meld with Istrid. Lesson three is to catch lightning in a bottle during a thunderstorm. Well, if her body is a bottle, then Yennefer was successful. Yay! <laughs> Yennefer angrily fires lightning out of her hand at Tissay, who parries it away. While all the other girls exit with their lightning bottles, Yennefer gets a scolding and a slap on the wrist. Back to Geralt and his bard, who we find have been captured by angry elves who've had their land stolen. They are a sick and dying race after the humans defeated them in the Great Cleansing. Geralt makes a stirring speech to their king, Philavandril, telling him to move on and build up and grow strong again instead of fighting a losing battle for the captured lands. Cut to Yennefer and Istrid. Yennefer is scared losing so many immunity challenges going to get her sent home from the island. So Istrid has her taste as forbidden flower, allowing her to travel to see him. He says this magic is older magic, from the time of elves, before humans killed them all and used their skulls as ornamentation for their towers. Yennefer confides in him her real father was a half-elf, and that's what caused her deformities and why she'll never be loved due to her body dysmorphia. And so they kiss. But we find it was all a ruse! And Yennefer stole the flower from Istrid to give that forbidden knowledge to Tessaia for her chance at ascension. What a dirty double cross! But wait, we also find out Istrid is working for Stregobor! It's the Quixotic Quadruple Cross! To Ciri now, whose camp is under attack from the Nilf Guardians. Ciri's new foster mom tries getting her elven servant to escape with the silver, but after he drops it and gets slapped, the servant takes the sterling silver knife set and stabs her 37 times in front of Ciri. Ciri escapes the tent, and we see the Nilf Guardian leader in the middle of the camp, clearly still after her. Back to Hogwarts, where we learn the ascension process is actually turning the students into eels to serve as power conduits for the sorcerers. Yennefer's backstabbery and rage seems to have earned Tissaia's favor, as she is spared from this. Back to Geralt and his bard, who we learn was granted freedom in exchange for the 150 pence purse Geralt was given to slay the Grain Devil. As a bonus, the bard also got himself a new loot in the deal, and with it takes creative license to start singing Toss a Coin to Your Witcher, so he can start making bank on iTunes and Spotify. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ciri is saved once again by Ratman, who is actually not a man, but an elf who she graciously follows. And we end the episode with Yennefer happily staring at her glowing pool of electric eels in her new role as Mickey, Sorcerer's Apprentice. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by the Electrical Power and Lighting Company. Oil spills, contaminated drinking water, coal miners disease, leaded gasoline, global warming. The number of environmental disasters that can be attributed to our reliance on fossil fuels that happen and continue to happen are countless. And even alternatives like nuclear and hydroelectric have created catastrophes making nearby areas uninhabitable. The simple fact is, the world is changing. And if we want to save it, then we need to change with it. Here at the Electrical Power and Lighting Company, we use human engineering and completely renewable resources to power our generators. And as an added bonus, all our human-made batteries were originally free-range destruction causing chaotic elements that have been put into perfect balance and placed in our state-of-the-art hydro sensor. That's Electrical Power and Lighting Company, we're shockingly clean energy. Back to you, Sesh and Maria. Wow. That, I mean, that, that might be our best commercial yet. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> All right. Hello, yeah. everybody. Uh, again, Maria might not be here. She might pop in a little bit later. We'll see what can happen. Uh, she uh, she won uh, uh, an award at a film festival this uh, uh, this weekend. So um, she is uh, uh, parting it up uh, probably with uh, with uh, Steven Spielberg right now. We'll see. She's She's a big shot now. <laughs> I know, I know. It's amazing. We're 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 dust now in the world. Now, now I feel like an intern. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sash, that's not how this works. <laughs> that is that is not 
not at all how the pay structure here uh, or the punishment no, no. system works. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so yeah, essentially, you know, she usually um, asks the questions. Do you want to ask the questions or do we want to take turns asking the questions? And we'll keep track of which ones um, we can come back to her with. Hopefully she'll be able to pop in. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So uh, I, I guess I can start. Um, uh, first question is, how do you compare Siri and Yennefer's origin stories? And which do you think has the makings of a leader based on their actions so far? So. We're going to start with uh, Maria, and this was her answer. So uh, pretend it's coming from an actual expert uh, who has experience and not from me, the intern. Mm -hmm. Siri lost her parents as a baby, was raised by kind royal grandparents, and lost them, her homeland, and her castle in one fell swoop with only the message to find Geralt to keep her going. Yennefer was treated like dirt because of her physical abnormalities, and that her real dad was half-elf and died many years ago. She is then sold by her family for less than the price of a pig. Both of these girls you feel for, but what they do next is very interesting. Siri shows signs of regal compassion as she shares her glove with the stranger that helped her, and is of the mind that she will be reunited with her people and gain her power again. Yet when one of her people is brutally murdered by an elf, she just stands and watches. Even though the lady cursed her grandparents and was cruel to the elf, one could argue she was a grieving woman. Her reaction of anger and bitterness wasn't out of the ordinary. But does this show that Ciri isn't entirely on one side or the other, in spite of her whole city being burned to the ground? It seems like there's more information she wants to know. But yet it is still strange she didn't at least try to help the woman. You could tell she was planning on turning her son into a knight once she regained her seat as princess. Yennefer makes some surprising choices, and that though she finally found a man to seemingly love her for who she is, she would rather betray him to find her own value with a witch that definitely doesn't seem like she can be trusted. Even being fine with scooping her friend turned deal into the water because she has been chosen really shows she tends to sell out for her much needed sense of self-worth. If I could guess, it would seem Yennefer has the makings of a pretty powerful bad guy, since her main goal is simply to be important, but not good. When Ciri, who was always told she was chosen to rule and be valued, doesn't have that need, and she doesn't seem like she has a basic sense of right and wrong. However, she hasn't quite gotten some answers she needs before choosing her side. She's been kept in the dark for too long, I think she falls right now as more of a chaotic good, where it's unclear exactly when or how she will behave in moral ways or not. Yennefer represents the fatal merging of the two warring species, elf and human, into a truly torn person looking for validation, while Ciri represents a human who has been altered possibly by dark forces. Neither of them belong, but their needs are vastly different. Wow. I um I didn't realize Maria was British. <laughs> I didn't realize I was British either, so it's uh it's, it's intriguing. Uh, I, I was gonna suggest us taking turns, her popping in, but I think British Maria's um her alter ego making an appearance is gonna be great. Uh, <laughs> so how do I compare the? I keep it up. I I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I sense a value in this in the British Maria. <laughs> so I just I can't wait to hear her reaction. That's gonna be my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so how do I compare Siri and Yennefer's origin stories, which do I think is going to be making a better leader? Ooh, oh, so this is an interesting question. So let's lay this out with where both of them are so far. Siri grew up in a loving her home, privileged, but maybe not overly spoiled princess where everything she's known has been violently swept away from her. She's adapting well, still naive, but being smart at least in that she's focusing on survival, um, taking only moments to change her mind about eating rats, for example. Yennefer, on the other hand, in many ways, had the opposite upbringing. The most influential difference, I'm sure, is the complete lack of love she's had growing up. Uh, being a bastard, being disabled, being mistreated by the townsfolk, as well as her stepfather having to 
work probably from the day she was first able to actually pick up a bucket. Uh, this was more her episode than series, I felt like. Um, so we see that Yennefer's eventually um, does find a better place to be um, within the witches and the witch teachings, the, the hard, Hogwarts, as you called it. <laughs> um, she struggles. She is still cruelly treated throughout the process. But and then we see her being looked at proudly for what I would have to guess has to be the first time in her entire life. So as leaders, I wonder who will remember to have compassion better and who of the two would be more jaded with how horrible humans can be. Currently, I haven't seen any anger or like real outburst um, like we have with Yennefer, but Yennefer is being taught to control her anger, literally to harness her chaos. Um, man, so based on what we've seen so far, I think I'm going to go off Surrey. Um, she had the upbringing, even though it was an incomplete upbringing, to be a leader, um, where wisdom was occasionally given. Uh, Yennefer has lived a life of a loner with no advice, only really verbal abuse, um, and that's going to leave her less equipped to lead. But I think with that kind of upbringing and seeing that she does have um, a genuine kindness in her somewhere, um, that maybe that'll make her a very good advisor. Interesting. Interesting. Um, uh, right now, I mean, I think a lot of it can be boiled down to nature versus nurture. You know, both Siri and Yennefer, as you said, went through the tragic events of parental loss at a young age. Siri, however, was unconditionally loved and raised by her grandparents and given a royal upbringing, where all were supposed to respect and love her and treat her as the beautiful child she is. Whereas Yennefer was raised by an abusive stepfather and weak-willed mother and taught that she would never be loved and she was mocked and bullied for all of her disfigurements. Siri became a girl who has kindness and a love for herself and her family and, is a, and a desire to do good. Uh, and Yennefer became a girl who hates herself and will succumb to evil temptations if it makes her more powerful and allows her to feel special, even if it's to someone who is cruel. When met with traumatic events and murders, Siri has shied away and ran, while Yennefer has attacked them head on with rage. So thus far, um, I think <laughs> Yennefer uh, would make a more powerful leader, albeit <laughs> an absolute monster. Uh, I think Siri could eventually become a good and beloved leader as she has a kind heart and empathy for others who have faced tragedy, but she still has, has much to learn. Um, and that leadership aspect was never taught to her by her grandparents who hoped to wait to teach her when she got older. Uh, so I think it will be interesting uh, 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 for sure. Um, but it, it does go to show that, yeah, up, upbringing counts in terms of the type of person you, you, you turn out to be a little bit later in life. Very true. Uh, so second question is, if you were Phil Evandrel, what would you have done with the Witcher and Bard? Also, would you take the Witcher's advice? So I'm going to start for this one. Um, and uh, honestly, it's really an awful position to be in. Uh, you're forced to either give up your ancestral lands you were expelled from by your enemies who committed genocide, or suffer a slow, torturous death to your race. And then you have to be further concerned whether or not a human and a humanoid witcher will tell the humans about your existence, which would likely end in total annihilation for you and your race. If I were Phil Evangel, I would definitely take what Geralt told me quite seriously, as he is correct and that the only real possibility that his people have is going someplace else and starting over. The real question, though, is if there actually is someplace else to go to where they won't be immediately attacked by humans. As well, this society would need to be very different from the one uh, which, was, uh, which they came from, which was willing to be open and impart wisdom to their neighbors. Instead, it would need to be a defensive and more military-based society that is adept at hiding and covering their tracks. This will make for a very dangerous eventual enemy of the humans. As for allowing them to live or die, I think the Witcher, based on what we know thus far, can be let go, as he is a neutral agent who seems to care little for political drama and would have almost no likelihood of saying anything about the elves or their whereabouts, just that he finished his task and the grain devil is no more. 
The human bard, though, that's another issue. I'd offer the bard a deal in which the bard lives, but must spend the rest of his days living in their golden palaces, quote unquote, <laughs> besides them, working with them hand in hand to rebuild their society and eventually tell their history as he cannot be trusted. And that's not just because of his race, but also his profession. Interesting. I mean, I definitely agree. It's definitely not a good position to be in. But with them letting them go anyways, maybe it means they're going to move from where they're staying. So I really liked Geralt's advice here. He's so great at appealing to the peaceful side of a situation. He's absolutely right in that being um, uh, the way to survive is learning how to live with the humans or away from them. Um, knowing that he lives from this advice himself, that he isn't happy about it, that he knows the world, humans are unfair, and really makes his argument even better. He emphasizes, he relates. Geralt even decides to accept Philandrel's choice after he says his piece. Once again, the choices that characters make matter in this series. And I'm also convinced by Geralt's words. I would have done the same and let the Witcher go. I may have said another word or two to the human with him about the truth history of elves and the kinds of stories to actually be spreading versus not to be spreading. But it was clear these two weren't the problem. And his advice was good, too. Finding better land further away from the humans, I think, is just a great idea. Yeah, uh, great points. Maria, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, Philavandrel seems like a nice king, tortured and very upset, but nice. Although if I were him, I would either kill the Witcher or keep the Bard and ransom and have the Witcher spy on the humans for me so I can figure out what my game plan should be. I mean, if the humans are stronger in defenses, then maybe it is good to get moving along. But if the Witcher can tell me their weaknesses, then I might as well get rid of them while they are still struggling from our massive attacks. Oh, that was that was very good military stra strategy. Wow. Yeah. British Maria is very military oriented. <laughs> she, you know, you know, you don't just become British, Sash. <laughs> <laughs> she truly is. <laughs> All right. The uh, the third question for the day. I I get the feeling. There are going to be so many angry comments uh, from from multiple people. One of one of which is is on this show regularly after this. But we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me see. I'll I'll ask this one. Um, uh, mm -hmm. The British Maria is up first. Um, how do you feel they are handling the themes of racism, assertion, and other lands and genocide in this episode? You know. I think they do it beautifully because they bring in the argument from both sides and through the eyes of a mostly human princess and a downtrodden half-elf, along with the backdrop of larger war. This makes it personal and makes you root for each of them, and they have to stop and say, wait a minute, who is really bad here? Yes, the elves destroyed the castle and the town cruel, cruelly, but that was in retaliation to genocide. What is real right and wrong here? I think that is what Siri is grappling with. She is supposed to be a ruler of her people, and she also wants to be a good person. Can you be both? It is a good question to ask ourselves. We want to be good people, but can we be good and live in an unjust society at the same time? How much should we do on a daily, weekly, monthly, etc. basis to bring ethical choices to our world while at the same time balancing the daily life responsibilities and desires? Yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement in, in many ways with what Maria says. I mm -hmm. think uh, in uh, this episode deals with it in a truly masterful, masterful way, uh, in my opinion. The writers and directors express racism, genocide, and stealing of ancestral land in very simple terms. However, they do it with a keen subtlety, sure that it isn't overly political or a forced agenda, more that this is what happened. This is how the world is. Now, how do you deal with that? Uh, and in, in regards to that, what decisions should you make? And what are the consequences of those decisions? 
it's very easy to see and hear what happened to the elves, put yourselves in their shoes, and go firmly in their corner, saying that great wrongs happen to them, and fight for them and their rights. However, it also comes with the realization that they aren't going to get those rights or their land back willingly from their opponent, and an even deeper understanding that fighting to do so would be the end of their race. There are some very strong real-world parallels to the elves of modern-day society, and if there is one thing to take away from all of that, is that there is no good or right answer here. There are better answers and worse answers, yes, but there will never be a perfect or fair answer to what happens after a genocide or post-racism, as the society can never truly fairly make up for what happened, nor can they avoid creating unfairness to others in the process. It's just a no-win situation. And I think that the show does a truly exceptional job in, un in allowing the viewers to understand that without being heavy-handed, which honestly is pretty unique uh, for, for shows. Most shows are very agenda-based when it comes to this. This one leaves things open. And uh, really, I think this is a must-watch for many global leaders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all too often seems to be very little understanding of this concept, which should honestly be more simple to understand than, than we make it. <laughs> very true. Um, yeah, there's a lot of layers here. I think they're handling it great. Um, they're showing and telling from a lot of different angles. Uh, we're seeing uh, the main truth for real world to remember is that the history is you know written by the victors so we're learning of the history versus the rumors of what's going on in this world um so like the elves and their golden castles in the mountains versus the mounds of elven skulls the human chaos users put on display for themselves after stealing their land and homes mm -hmm. so it's very interesting to see that dynamic of what's the rumors versus what the true history is um like another really important aspect the show puts um front and center is is it really is like how the humans have taken over in this way and obviously they're making it clear that all of them are bad but there's still there's still um tainting things in a certain way they're still becoming more and more problems amongst them like the humans have removed all the victimhood from the elf side of things I, I really like how in all three stories we're following, we get just a little taste of what the world is like for elves and for magical folk, for the few that are, you know, still alive. Um, and like their plight, like might not be the main story being told, but it's so interwoven with all the main characters and their experiences, which I mean, I love to see that because it sends a message that stuff like this, it really does touch all of us and it is very important for all of us to be aware of yeah you know i absolutely agree with you sesh and i i must say you know where you talk about adorning their structures with with the skulls of their enemies you know if you think about uh the british empire um and if you've ever been to the british museum uh they went ahead and they did they took from different cultures from all around the world. And they basically went ahead and presented them as relics, except they didn't even have understanding of where those relics were from or what they actually meant or represented. So instead, they just put them on there and they treated them as their exploits, but without any, under, un, any further understanding of the races or the people. And, you know, we just live in that sort of society where in a lot of ways we have to look within ourselves and what we do and how we treat other cultures. No wonder British Maria came out. <laughs> At that, and I had no other accent. Yeah, no. <laughs> that sounds like Maria entirely. What are you talking about, Sesh? Uh <laughs> <laughs> so, next question <laughs> Do you think Yennefer and Istrid? Have, ha have real feelings for each other past the agenda they're both being put on? Um, from the other thing, <laughs> it would seem to be that Istrid was at first set out to spy on Yennefer, but has actually fallen for her. Well, it would seem Yennefer at first liked him, but is really after a much bigger prize. I think she isn't really ready for love. She's got to learn to love herself first which may take insane powers and murdering half of the populace for her to attain, possibly replacing her spine with some innocence in the process. 
Wow, Maria, that is. <laughs> that, that is dark. Bridge Maria came today. I kind of, I, yeah, dark Maria is here. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of for it. I, I kind of agree. I, I do think it's kind of tricky, this question, actually. I think their first meeting, the spontaneous one, um, was kind of impactful to both of them and had a lot of kindness to it. I felt like we kind of skipped some of their hangouts um, in this episode and the time that elapses. It seemed to move a little fast. And the double reveal at the end, um, I think, kind of explains this. Um, but I got the feeling they had re a real connection um, underneath some layers. But that they both might be keeping the real feelings guarded or buried or maybe even a little ignored. I think Yennefer is finding her loyalty, which is why the timing might have felt off to me. Like the turning point of when she would have actually helped to spy in this way didn't quite line up with when she found that trust and support elsewhere outside of Istred, um, especially since she met him first. But I also think she might have just liked the excuse to hang out with him more, even if she might be denying those real feelings. I think she's enjoying playing pretend with him. So, I mean, Istra definitely seemed reluctant to provide the information that he did. Um, so I think he's maybe a little more connected to his feelings than her. Interesting. Interesting. Um, for me, uh, I'd say they do. But the real question is how much? Yennefer does appear to like the idea of someone finding value in her and is romanced by the idea of someone loving her. But her quest for strength and power is even greater right now. So while I do think she has feelings for Istrid, those feelings won't hold her back from hurting him to gain greater recognition and power. As for Istrid, he seems to have a general care for her, but it does appear he's also working her pretty hard uh, to get what uh, to get whatever information Stregobor wants that we don't quite know yet. Um, he is a real wild wild card in my opinion because I think he he hides his actual emotions and intent a lot better overall. So overall, I think they both do, but currently I'd say Yennefer has stronger feelings for him than mm -hmm. he does for her. So we'll see what ends up happening. It sounds like all three of us have uh, have different conflicting viewpoints on this. So very true, very true. Good, good question, Maria. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Very good question, Maria. <laughs> Oh, now it's going to be the most fun. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. I mean, I'll, I thought for the this entire, I knew what this question was, and I thought I was going to be the worst at it, but now I know it's going to be British Maria. <laughs> Are you sure? Oh, man. British Maria might be able to bring it. Um, Maybe British Maria will be the best. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to ask the question. <laughs> sure. If you, uh, question five is, and this is our fun one uh, for the afternoon, if you were the bard for the Witcher, give us a line or two of your song you'd make for him. Sesh, why don't you start first? <clears throat> mm. Praise the casting of the Witcher, O Henry of Cavill, O Henry of Cavill. Praise the casting of the Witcher, treasures to humanity. That's all I got. I wanted to come up with another one, but that's, uh, that's what we got. So... Well, <laughs> that is, that is quite, quite beautiful. Um, yes, yeah, so what would you have to say, uh, uh, Maria? <laughs> he thrust his neck to the elf on our trek, and he laid down his sword without a word. The witcher is strong, the witcher is kind, the witcher won't let me say any more rhymes. Oh, well done, well done, British. Oh. British. Oh, yeah, I changed my mind. Uh, British Maria is gonna gonna nail this one. That's uh, I think that's a winner for me already. <laughs> All right. Upon a golden mount of wheat, a man of such few words, with an eloquence befit a king, a horned devil he entered. Oh, Geralt, please don't hit me. My gut is still reeling and my brain is still bleeding. So, Geralt, please don't hit me. I'm singing your song with feeling. We should never ask this question again. Nope, never. <laughs> it is banned. Uh, sorry to We our... should all just sing the original song. <laughs> <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are, we are getting. Wow, British Maria, damn, there was a good chance you got this down. Uh, you know what, Maria's killing it today. She's, uh, 
Uh, she did not phone this one in. I'll tell Maybe. you. That. We, I mean, we might just have Maria and British Maria here. <laughs> <laughs> might as well kick me out of this. Uh, so let's see, let's see if we have uh, have uh, uh, any comments. Uh, we have a good late evening uh, from uh, Chris. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, Yennefer was such a good character introduction from Bear. Absolutely agreed. Uh, what acting from that character, by the way? Uh, we have we haven't mentioned that yet, have we? No, all, I mean I had praising the casting in my song, so that was you that did. was my, that was my nod. All of the casting is amazing. All of the acting is fabulous in this show. It's really great. So that's why I needed to include it in my bad song. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 been pretty amazing, and and she really has done a a great job. Uh, Bear is enjoying doppelganger uh, uh, Maria. Um, <laughs> You know, Maria's Maria's pretty wonderful. She is she is she is the heart and soul of this show. So, uh, uh, you know, she comes in, <laughs> in many varieties and forms. Uh, so too, we introduced Doppelganger Maria. We did. We did. <laughs> we the main did. character. <laughs> she she sounds a little bit more evil than than regular Maria, and and prone to violence. But you know, I I think I think the show did need that a little bit. So. <laughs> I thought I filled that void, but I didn't know. I, I didn't know what British Maria could do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great points, Maria. Yep, yep. And uh, oh, yep, Sesh, you got some love uh, as as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, everyone being uh, being perfectly uh, uh, being perfectly casted in the show, not necessarily um, uh, 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 in this in this show that we're doing right now, I mean, I'm sure if they could get a an improvement over the intern, they would. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, they're they're legally obligated to stick with uh, with one uh, for you know different funding purposes. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys uh, for taking me on again this year. All right, uh, so we will finally go ahead and get to the part everyone has been waiting for which is the rating section, and would you continue watching? Uh, I will start. Um, I, I thought this episode was absolutely terrific. Um, in fact, I think it was better than the pilot when it came to dialogue, plot, and progression. Uh, and the complex and often controversial topics of racism and genocide, I felt the show handled with tremendous care and subtlety and much aplomb, really. Um, I felt this was a masterful episode, and it fixed pretty much any issue I had with the pilot. Uh, if I'm being really nitpicky, I think the episode did jump around a little too much at the end of the episode for its own good. Um, but otherwise, this was a really, really, really good episode. Uh, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, uh, a great, well-written and directed episode in which, granted, nothing groundbreaking happens, but it does a phenomenal job of building the plot in, in universe. I just say, great job. Uh, honestly, if anything like super substantial happened, I probably would have given this a, a, a 10 out of 10. But you know, for for what it was, I mean, this was this was pretty good. Uh, definitely, definitely grew the episode. So nine out of 10 uh, uh, from me. Oh, hold on. Uh, that might be uh, that might be Maria. Sesh, do you want to go? Do we? Have, if we have American Maria coming, I will go next. Um, yeah, so go ahead. Me, go ahead. I'm definitely interested, and I love the way they're presenting the history and more of the world. How there's so many different types of people: humans, witches, warlocks, witchers, the differences between them, and all the kinds of intelligent humanoids that must exist in this world is great. I really love that magic is just chaos in this world. It that's just so such a cool conceptual way to look at it um, for me. Still, though, everyone has like their own struggles to overcome. Um, I, I want to know more of this world, and I'm already like so in love with the Geralt and Dandelion dynamic. So, of course, I know. I mean, yeah, I'm going to keep watching. This is a rewatch for me. Um, for me, though, structurally, this episode loses a little bit because it doesn't quite hit as hard as the first episode did. Um, just structurally, though, uh, writing wise, the scenes, the dialogue is really great. But I'm really trying to pinpoint the timeline of when Yennefer's story is taking place here. And I was looking for the clues because I know of future things 
that now in this episode, we've already jumped in the future with when we are with Geralt. But on the rewatch, I'm frustrated that that's not been made clear than that I can't pinpoint in a first story's beginning timeline wise either so also i'm a little frustrated with some of the things in the first story that were omitted for the sake of the double reveal of her and istrid's romantic double cross so this episode does do a lot perfectly um both on like the cruel side of the world and actually does like just such a good job once again at being surprisingly funny somehow even with everything and all the themes that we've mentioned um so i think i can only give it maybe a seven and a half or eight with those few missteps but do keep in mind the song is a 10 out of 10 that's a gem that's going to be stuck in your head for weeks (laughs) that that is surprising to hear like i didn't know I guess it's interesting to hear from. Oh, I should, I should, I should go British, but uh, <laughs> good lord! <laughs> no, but it, <laughs> uh, that's surprising to hear that there were some things that were, were misstepped a little bit for this episode because it seemed, I guess, from a new watcher's perspective, to come to come across really well. Um, for me, yeah, for me, gosh. Uh, the show is amazing. Um, I am just thrilled that it went from a great opening to an even better first episode. Uh, this episode's opening alone was so incredibly strong. The acting was stupendous. I found myself enwrapped in the story and the meaning once again, instead of struggling just to get by, uh, falling over the story and tripping on the dialogue in our previous uh, show. <laughs> Uh, the writers, you know, they I feel like they have a true command of story and know how to work a deeper message into a very engaging and artful story. I gave this episode a 9 out of 10. It left me with some questions, but not in a bad way. Those, those are my thoughts. Yeah, that's very good. Now, did just... Jonathan give, give his review, or can I do British Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know his number. I, we might have to let you have a whole episode of British Jonathan on time. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I think it, I think it's really interesting. And I um, I did skip ahead real quick and like go ahead and watch episode three, which I will say fixes my one complaint. So <laughs> this one, it's great. Like it's it really is so good. I'm so happy you guys are enjoying this, and it's such a difference from our last series it's so much more enjoyable like I could sit and just do one like every day almost (laughs) I know I mean when you said like oh you know this is this is like uh what you wanted like Game of Thrones to be kind of thing I'm like okay sure (laughs) Sure. I'm telling you this is like (laughs) top tier dark fantasy (laughs) it's fabulous and then and then you hear oh it's based on a video game and I'm not trying to knock that but it's like okay I think technically based on a book that is a video game that is yeah yeah so it's it's based on just a whole bunch of nerdy things <laughs> it's incredible I am so enjoying this I'm probably gonna see the next episode tonight to be honest <laughs> I'm already looking forward to the review of the next one um like I said I jumped ahead and I I really enjoyed next episode that's all I'll say for reasons. Ooh, ooh, okay. <laughs> I'll bring those reasons up later. Okay, we'll find but, that. I think, I bet I'll know the second I see it. I'll be like, okay, that's why. <laughs> you can you can tell within the first scene why I might be partial towards this next episode. Okay. I believe it is the first scene. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, I will butcher Jonathan's uh, answer. I'll let him. I'll let him do it, and um, I will uh, be back with him. <laughs> We're gone again. British Maria might make another appearance. This might be a, on- uh, a reoccurring oh, thing. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, I already answered this question, right? Or do we have another another question that was yes. being asked? You, you gave your your rating. I think I'm the low ball here just because I was looking for a thing um, that I didn't see in this episode. But everything else is just top tier. 10 out of 10, except that one thing that I was looking for. <laughs> Beautiful. 
beautiful. Um, yeah, I know you were you were the low one uh, uh, this time. I know. Going, love it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. You know, it it does go to show. Like rewatching it, especially if you've seen uh, the whole session, maybe uh, different things uh, spark compared to a first time viewer. Which is why I am glad that we're doing this show a little bit uh, because it does give different uh, perspectives. Um, it fun because I feel like I like it this episode more than when I had first seen it because this time I was able to pinpoint um, the couple of little missteps that I felt like they did. Um, so I was looking for those I was like, am I right about this? Okay, I am. Those were definitely the reasons because I love everything else about it. Yeah, um, Bear uh, gave it a solid 9.5 out of 10. Uh, only due to timelines being hard to understand, but also enjoy the surprise. So uh, that's 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 pretty cool. Um, yeah, clearly there's something going on with the timelines. I wonder what it could be. Um, but being new to this, I have no idea. Makes sense, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, there were some there were some uh, allusions to that fact. Um, uh, there were different lines in terms of. Uh, you know, is the past just repeating itself? Is, you know, uh, are we going ahead and we having a circle? You know, is this Carcosa? Um, by the way, if you haven't seen True Detective, uh, see True Detective, uh, great show. <laughs> so. In the off time, <laughs> more shows in to watch. off time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, we should have done done a series on that. I don't know, know what we were thinking there. That was uh, yeah, the show that's a nine out of 10 every single episode. What were we thinking? Yeah, yeah, I know, big mistake. So um, in any case, uh, thank you uh, all for uh, for joining us this evening and watching until the end. Um, we really appreciate uh, all your support. And hopefully uh, we brought you some intelligent conversation, uh, some laughs tonight, and some culture, uh, thanks to Maria. Um, and uh, Maria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And really, it's your support that uh, makes this uh, that that makes this all uh, worth it. So, if you like this show, please like, share, subscribe, heart, uh, do those likey things. And if you hated this show, <laughs> please make sure to go ahead and you like this show twice uh, because we have metrics that show specifically who liked this multiple times. And that really helps us change the show for the better, you know, makes it a better show. We cater specifically to you. So keep liking away twice as many times as you can. We'll we'll see it in there and uh, and we'll make the show better in the future for you for it. Um, our next episode will be on Monday, November 21st at 7 p.m. Pacific. That's 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you then in our new time slot with, uh, with the time changes. So, uh, if we don't have any other questions, let's see, we do not. Until next time. Pass a coin to could, the witcher. Good. <laughs> I'm stepping on my lines, man. Oh. You gotta do it in the tune. <laughs> I do. So until You until do it better. <laughs> Could you do it better? All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice night. Uh, this was wonderful. <laughs>